what we've been doing here these past couple of Sundays has got you guys thinking a little bit. Um, that's really the whole purpose of this. And hopefully it has got you kind of digging into the Word of God, um, maybe even digging into some science a little bit too as well. Um, so let's get started. We're going to um, just kick it off here with chapter 3, verse 1, okay? Um, things get a little interesting. So you read the, the two accounts of the creation story in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, okay? So now things get a little interesting. So right now, everything's still good, okay? It's just the way that God created it. God created everything good, and everything's hunky-dory at this point. Until we get to verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Okay. So, um, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, again, the, the Hebrews didn't always write in, in chronological order. So, from chapter 1 to chapter 3. Doesn't necessarily make everything in chronological order. Number two, we have a talking, talking snake. Kind of unusual. I've never ran into a talking snake. Um, I hope I never run into a talking snake. I don't have problems with snakes necessarily. Um, however, if one started talking to me, I would, it would cause me to stop and, and think about what's going on. Whereas Randy might also do, maybe shoot it. I don't know. Um, so it probably wouldn't be a bad idea whenever you run into a talking snake. Just pull out the 410, shoot it. Okay. All right, um, but whether this is literally a talking snake or this is a figuratively, I'm not going to argue that today, okay? Let's just suffice to, to know and understand that we are talking about Satan at this point. Whenever or God is talking about Satan, the writer of Genesis is talking about Satan. So when he says the serpent here, um, he's talking about Satan. Now, how do we know that? If you go to Revelation chapter 12, this isn't the only time that... Satan is referred to as a serpent. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to read verses 7 through 9. It says, Then war broke out in heaven. Okay, so this is not in the physical realm of things, okay? Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So there's this war. Whenever people talk about spiritual warfare, I often think of this, this particular scripture here. Um, and then so in, in verse 9 it says, So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. So it seems the writer of Revelation, who is the Apostle John, or John the Apostle, however you want to say it, is, is kind of referencing back here to Genesis chapter 3, um, whenever he's talking about Satan. Okay? So now immediately you see Satan showing his true colors here in verse 1. He's lying to Eve, right? Um, he's talking about... Um, whether or not they're able to eat from any tree. He says, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Which is not what God said, right? If you guys go back to chapter 2, that's not what God said. And this isn't the only time that Satan does this. Satan loves to take the word of God and twist it around for us and make us think that God is saying one thing when he's not. Okay, that's why it's so important for us to memorize Scripture. Okay, it's because Satan's going to try to make you remember Scripture and remember it wrongly. He's going to lie to you. He's going to get you to twist that scripture around so that you believe something other than what is the truth. He actually did that with Jesus while Jesus was out in the wilderness. I mean, of all people to try to deceive, right? The Son of God, our Creator, okay? But he does. And he, and he takes the Word of God and he quotes it to Jesus himself. And what does Jesus do? He quotes scripture right back to Satan, which is what we should do whenever Satan is lying to us as well. Let's continue on and see what, Eve's, what Eve does with Satan and how she responds to him. So we're going to start back off in verse 2 here. All right. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat 
the fruit from the trees in the garden. Okay, yeah. So she's right so far. Um, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Okay? That's not exactly what God said. God said, don't eat from the tree or you will die. All right? His instructions weren't explicitly don't touch it. However, it's probably a good idea that if God commands you not to go over there, probably just a good idea to just stay away from that area in general. You get what I'm saying? So it wasn't a bad idea to not touch the tree. All right? Probably actually a good idea to not touch the tree. But it's not exactly what God had told them um, to do. Okay? Um, so, anyway, let's go on to verses 4 and 5. So Satan continues. He says, No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All right. So now here, Satan is doing with people, with Eve and Adam. We'll see Adam here in a little bit. Um, what he wants, right? Because the whole reason that Satan is in the mess that he is in is because he wanted to be like God. The verses that we just read in, in Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 12, all right, that happened because Satan wanted to be like God. In fact, he wanted to be greater than God, okay? That's why that whole war took place. And so now he's trying to deceive Adam and Eve into thinking, hey, you come over here and you eat this fruit that God told you not to eat, you're going to be just like him. In fact, you're going to be equal to him. Okay? Now, Scripture has something to say about that. Later on, Jesus addresses that issue about being equal to God. But we'll, we'll address that another day. But suffice it to say now, for now that we cannot be equal to God. All right? But Satan wants us to think that sometimes. So he's trying to deceive Eve here and thinking, look, God's trying to keep something from you. You have this good thing over here. If you look at it, it's a nice-looking tree. It's pretty, okay? Why don't you come over here and taste some? Because God's trying to keep something from you. Come over here and take what's yours, right? How many of you guys hear that so often today? Just come get what's yours, okay? You deserve it. It's all yours, okay? Um, but, you know, it seems that God was actually trying to protect Adam and Eve. He was trying to protect his creation, now, for parents in the room, I know this is true for myself. I imagine it's true for all the other parents in the room. How many of you here who are parents know things about what goes on in this world that you would prefer your kids not know? I mean, there are a lot of things that I know that go on in this world that are absolutely horrendous. And I would be just fine if my kids never, ever knew about them. Not because I think that they can't handle it, but man, it would be so much better if they didn't even know about it, okay? I would feel better not knowing that those things existed sometimes, okay? Sometimes ignorance is bliss. I've probably told you guys this story a hundred times, but I'll tell it to you again just because it fits with this illustration. My uncle took me and my cousins to a swimming hole one time, and... Um, we were, we were out there swimming. My uncle says, hey, guys, don't go over here to this area of the swimming hole because it's just bad. Don't go over there. And I said, well, why? He said, because I said so. Well, for me, that was not good enough. I needed a very good reason why to not go over to that area of the swimming hole. It was real leafy and weedy and, and gross. I mean, in this type of swimming hole, this is in, in Oklahoma, you really can't see in the water anyway. So you just kind of get out there and you swim and you kind of hope for the best. Um, and anyway, but so I'm out there swimming. I really wanted to go over to that area that my uncle told me I could not go to because I didn't know why I shouldn't be over there. So I had a swimming mask with me. I don't know why because you can't see under the water anyhow. Um, and I took off my swimming mask and I threw it over there to that area. My uncle's mad at me at this point. He says, fine, you swim, in over, you swim right over there and you go get it. And I did. And then I come out of the swimming hole, and I am just completely covered in leeches. Now, that is not a great experience. That is a great learning experience, really, to obey your uncle. <laughs> Whenever he says, don't go to that part of the swimming hole, you stay away, all right? I was covered in leeches, and it took a long time to get all those little suckers off, okay? So, yeah, 
God wants to protect us sometimes. In fact, all the time. Whenever he gives us rules, it's for our own protection. It's not that he doesn't want you to have good things, okay? He wants you to have good things. He wants you to um, have a, an, an enjoyable life, okay? But we have, to, we have to obey those boundaries. We have to stay within those boundaries because so they, they keep us safe. All right. Well, let's go on to verses 6 and 7 then here in, in chapter 3. There we go. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. That's significant. Keep note of that. Okay. Um, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. This is great. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. I am so thankful for cotton right now, um, because I cannot imagine that that um, is the most comfortable of clothing. But the point here is that sin typically looks good on the outside. I mean, Eve's looking at this tree, and it looks, the fruit looks nice. She wants to eat some of it. It looks like it's good to eat, just like the other trees in in the garden. In fact, this one probably looks probably almost prettier than the other trees, I would imagine. Um... So she goes on over there and she takes a bite. Now, this is significant to me. Um, Adam was standing here the entire time that all this was taking place. Now, let's jump back or think back to Genesis chapter 2. Who did God specifically give the command to not eat from that tree to? Adam, right? He was directly talking to Adam when he gave that command. And here Adam is standing with his wife that God specifically created for him, and he's watching her talk to Satan, being deceived by Satan this entire time, and he watches her walk over to this tree, take a piece of fruit, and take a bite out of it. Now, men, those of you guys that are sitting here are married, young men who are not married yet, take note of this. You are to be leaders in your households, okay? It is not always fun to be leaders in your households. It is hard. Um, It can be uh, troublesome sometimes because, I mean, we're sinful beings. We don't always lead the best way, okay? But we are to be leaders in our households, and we are to protect our wives. We are to protect our children. Whenever we see them going towards that sin, we need to stop them, okay? Okay? We need, to, we need to protect our families. That, that is our job as, as husbands and fathers is to protect our families. Um, and whenever God tells you, gives you a specific command, we need to obey that, okay? All right, let's keep reading then in verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I love that. Okay, first, they're sewing together fig leaves to try, to try to hide their sin, okay? Now, God's walking around. Uh, the, the guy who knows everything, who just created everything, okay, walking around in the garden, and they're like, okay, well, let's go hide over here behind this bush. God surely won't find us over here behind the mulberry bush, okay? Um, I don't know why I chose mulberry. I just popped in my head and then came right out, okay? Okay. Um, but it's just so interesting to me. They hear God and they go hide. So anyway, so the Lord God called out to man and said to him, where are you? And uh, Adam responds, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, this is God. So God asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, so a few things going on here. Um, one, Adam and Eve do what we on a regular basis today try to do whenever we sin, right? We try to hide our sin. And, and sometimes we get kind of good at it because we do it so often. We get a lot of practice, okay? And you parents in here, have you caught your kids trying to hide their sin, okay? Now, I remember trying to do this when I was a kid. And 
I think there was a few times where my dad, I knew, I could see in my dad's eye whenever I was lying to him, and he could tell. And so there were times where he just kind of let me slide through. I don't know why, but I could see it in his eyes that he was, you know, he's like, I'm not, I'm not buying what you're trying to sell me here, son. But anyway, um, we do this often as parents. We can see what our kids are trying to do. I think that's what God is, because he's, he immediately says, hey, did you try to eat from this, or did you go eat from that tree? Because whenever you eat from that tree, that's when you're going to realize that you're naked. So that's probably what happened, right? Um, the other thing that's significant is that God's walking around in the garden. It seems that this occurred on a regular basis, okay? Now, this lends itself to what we talked about, our purpose for creation, okay? Why were we, why were we created? For relationships, okay? It seems that God walked around with man on a regular basis. He wanted to be in relationship with man, and he still wants to be in relationship with us, okay? And we'll see that later on this afternoon. All right, and then God begins to question Adam about the situation. So let's pick up again in verse 12. I love this part. Then the man replied, the woman you gave me, I I can just stop right there, the woman you gave me, okay, um, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. It wasn't my fault, okay? The woman that, that you gave me, God, you know, you placed her here. She got deceived. She deceived me, and it all fell apart. So really, it's the woman's fault, and it's God's fault. I mean, that's kind of how we like to play things today, right? Whenever we get caught in something, what's our initial reaction? We want to deflect responsibility, okay? All right, now it continues on. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? Well, Eve taken a page from her husband's notes. She deflects responsibility as well, right? Um, she said it was the serpent. He deceived me and I ate it. So again, not Eve's fault. All right. Um, I was being a little sarcastic there in case you didn't pick up what I was laying down. All right. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you're cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly, eat dust all the days of your life. All right. Now it starts to get interesting because God is beginning to put a curse on his creation, all right? This is what sin does, okay? God created everything to be good. We brought, and and here's the key, key part here, it is man that brought sin into the world, okay? You can kind of get into this, this argument about where did sin come from? Did God create sin, et cetera, et cetera? No, God didn't create sin, We brought it into this world, okay, by our own choices. Because what is sin? Definition definition of sin is simply disobedience to God, okay? So when we disobeyed God, we brought sin into this world. And we just, just, well, we just started destroying the the good creation that, that God made for us, okay? So God begins to curse his creation, and he starts with the serpent. Then he goes on to say in verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children in anguish. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. So don't take away from that verse to not listen to your wife, okay? That's not what God's saying. He's saying that you knew what my command was, but you listened to somebody else instead of me, okay? That's what he's getting at. All right. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by the means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat, now this is significant, the the thorns and thistles part. We'll get there in a little bit. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it, for you are dust, and you will return to dust. Okay, let's pause there for a minute. 
All right. So God's cursing his creation. He starts off with his serpent. Now, in verse 16, it seems to indicate that pain already existed as a part of a good creation. All right. Now, that can seem kind of weird to think of pain being a good thing. All right. Now, in what type of situation could pain, because most of us try to avoid pain for the most part, right? You're getting ready to experience uh, some of this, so I apologize in advance. Um, but it'll be all worth it after however many hours it takes you to, to do what you got to do. But it'll be bad. It'll be bad, but it's worth it, okay? All right. So... Yeah. Okay. All right. So my wife's making fun of me now, um, and that's okay. I open myself up for that. All right. Um, speaking of pain, I got to take the best five-second nap yesterday I have ever had. And it was such a nice, deep sleep for five seconds. Now, I'm not going to tell you how that occurred right now, but we can talk about that afterwards. Um, so anyway, pain already existed in a good creation. Why is pain good? Well, pain is an indicator for something bad happening, right? Okay? Now, the easy, the easy uh, analogy there is whenever you touch a hot stove, you, you immediately bring your hand off of the hot stove, hopefully, because it's burning, right? right? It, feel, it feels bad. You touch that. It's painful. Ouch. You get away from it. Hopefully... You learn from that experience, and you don't do it again. Some people are stubborn, and we'll go back and do that again, okay? Now, um, so pain can be a good indicator of when you should stop doing something or not do that thing again, all right? How many of us, how many of you guys are here are married? Okay. Um, how many of you that are here that are married have ever had a fight with your spouse? Okay, Here, here's why. Um, it explains it in Genesis chapter 3, why this occurs. Um, he said, uh, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. If you, if you read on into the New Testament, um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, um, I think it's in Corinthians, if I remember right, he, he's telling them, he's like, look, whenever you get married, you're going to have troubles. Whenever you, I mean, in relationships in general, because we are people, we are sinful people, we have troubles, don't we? Okay? But especially in, in that marriage relationship, it, it, things get complicated, all right? And so we have to be patient with each other, work those things out. But marriage is not quite like what it's portrayed in Hollywood is kind of what I'm getting at, okay? So for you younger people here that are not married, don't be afraid of it, okay? It's a good thing, all right? So, anyway, how many of you guys in here have ever tried to grow a garden? Okay? So, when you grow a garden, you can put the, you, you know, you, you have your ground, you, you dig a hole, you prepare the ground, you dig your hole, you put the seed in, you cover it up, and then you, you wait for the rain, hopefully, and then it grows and it produces fruit, and it's just that easy. I wish. Um... What, what else grows in your garden besides green beans and corn? Everything, okay? Weeds are amazing uh, organisms, okay? Weeds and thorns and thistles and those things, they can grow in a drought. Uh, they don't seem to really need any water at all, and they just grow like crazy, okay? Um, there can be no dirt, and they still grow. I, don't, I do not understand weeds. They grow anywhere and everywhere with or without water. It doesn't matter. Weeds are always there. You can never keep them out of your garden. You have to work very, very hard to keep them out of your garden. We produce chemicals. We produce little, um, what are those things called? Where you, those weed barriers. Yes, weed barriers. Those things that you lay down in your garden, those don't work. I'm sorry. Weed barriers are, are just a, a way for them to get money out of my pocket. I mean, it's a good way. It works. They, I, I buy them, so, and they still don't work. So anyway, um, you know, notice that the thorns and thistles, weeds in general, 
are part of the curse. Now, what does that indicate about what was before the curse in regards to thorns and thistles? They weren't there, right? Okay, so if thorns and thistles were part of the curse, then it seems to indicate that before sin, there were, there were no thorns and thistles. Okay, that's what it seems to indicate. Now, think about that whenever you go and study a fossil record. Okay, uh, just keep that in mind the next time you go and look at the fossil record. I don't know if, how many of you guys are in here just on a daily basis looking at the fossil record. I don't know. Um, but next time it comes up, think about thorns and thistles and what you read here in Genesis chapter 3. All right, so um, let's move on then to verse 20, and we're going to read on through 24. Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. That's significant. Remember that part. The Lord God said, to, said, since man has become like us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat, and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove man out and, sank, and stationed the cherubim and the flaming, whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay? So God really didn't want them getting to this tree. All right. Now, why is that? Um, actually, let's back up for a second. <clears throat> this part here is highly, highly important whenever you're thinking about creation and evolution. Okay? Um, it's the issue of death. How did death come into the world? Well, according to the Scripture, death came into the world through sin. All right? Now, Let's, let's look further, because I've told you guys before in the past, we shouldn't just look at a single verse and think, okay, I, I've settled it. So let's look at a couple other verses. Let's go, go to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Many of you may know this one by heart, and that is great. I hope that you do. Um, if you don't, this is a good one to memorize. Actually, all of it's good to memorize. Um, but this would be a good starting point even. So let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is a wage? It's a paycheck, right? It's something that you've earned, okay? So that whenever you, you, you have a job, you, you go to work, you, you perform the thing that, that your employer, you and your employer agreed you would do, and then you receive a paycheck, which is what the two of you agreed would be paid, right? So in this instance here, um, the paycheck for sin is death, okay? So the Apostle Paul is telling the Romans, look, whenever you sin, you die. That's how death entered the world, was through sin, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a, there's a workaround for us there. All right. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I really love this, this chapter in, in 1 Corinthians. And you'll see why here in a little bit. I'm going to start in verse 21. Um, yep, verse 21 says, For since death came through a man, that man was the guy we just read about, Adam, okay? Um, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So the Apostle Paul here is making a connection between Adam and Jesus Christ. Okay, he's making a connection between what you read in the book of Genesis and the gospel that you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, so we're going to keep going here in, in 1 Corinthians. Let's, let's move on ahead to verse 45. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being. 
The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. All right? Uh, I'm going to go on to verse 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. So you have the first Adam, which is the Adam that you read about in the book of Genesis. Then you have the last Adam, which you read about in the gospel, who is also our, also our creator. Now, earlier we talked about um, Jesus being our creator and, and the talk of the Trinity there in Genesis chapter 1, right? And we connected that with John chapter 1 in the gospel, all right? You guys remember that? Whenever we read John chapter 1, it says the Word was God and, the, and everything was created through Him. And from the beginning, it always, He always existed, all right? So, um, and if, if you don't remember that, go back and, re and reread that, John chapter 1. Connect that with Genesis chapter 1, okay? So Jesus is our creator, and Jesus is also the one who provided a way out of this sin, okay? All of this leads us to the importance of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Genesis 3, 21. Genesis 3, 21. So... Um, it says, Then the Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and Eve, and he clothed them. Okay, where do you get skin to make clothing? Out of, from animals, right? Okay, so what did that animal, what had to take place for that animal to give up skin? Death, exactly. So here in Genesis chapter 3, three it seems that we have the first recorded animal death. That's very significant whenever you're thinking about this whole creation evolution thing. Now it's also very significant whenever you're thinking about the importance of the gospel, the importance of the cross. Because if you think back to Genesis 2, what did God say would happen whenever they ate that tree, ate from that tree? They were going to die. Now the way it is stated there, it seems like that should have been an immediate death right away their punishment was supposed to be death what does God do for them instead he provides a substitute guys and that substitute was just temporary you read through, if you keep reading through the Old Testament they had to go through the sacrificial system where they sacrificed animals to atone for their sin. Now, several thousand years later, you have Jesus Christ, our Creator, on earth. Your Creator. On earth. Walking around, experiencing the temptations that you and I experience. Experiencing the hardships that you and I experience. You think you have it hard right now? Um, we're, we all have pretty good compared to what Jesus Christ went through for us. Okay? When you go to... In fact, I want to I wanna read Luke 23 for you guys. I really like... Um, Luke is probably my favorite gospel. I got that, that gospel account, the way that, that he writes it. I just like the way that he writes. So verse 39 in Luke chapter 23. So right now you have Jesus is up on the cross. He's been tried. The, the, the Pharisees want him crucified for, for being, for blasphemy is what they said. They just didn't get it yet. Sometimes we don't get it. It's, it's easy to point fingers at the Pharisees. Then one of the criminals, there's two other men there who were also being crucified. One of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other one answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we are getting back what we deserve for the things that we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. 
There are two criminals. There were two criminals on crosses up there that day with Jesus Christ. One rejected Jesus Christ. He was being punished for his sins justly. The other one also understood that he was justly being punished for his sins, but he also rightly understood who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ was doing that day for him, for you, for me. Your creator God took on human flesh so that he could substitute himself in death for you. That's what Paul was trying to explain there in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus Christ being that last Adam. And through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I have the ability to choose life. So I'm going to give you the opportunity today to either accept that substitutionary death of Jesus Christ or to reject it. I mean, honestly, you can think of yourself as one of those two criminals hanging on a cross beside Jesus Christ. Are you going to be the criminal who understands, hey, I'm, I'm up here and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm going to be killed here in a little bit. I really wish Jesus would save me, so I'm going to make fun of him and, and hope that he does. Are you going to reject, are you going to be that criminal that rejects Jesus Christ? Are you going to be the man that understands, yeah, I am a sinner. And what I am getting today, I rightly deserve. I should die for the things that, that I have done in my life. And only God can make things right between me and Him. And I want to accept Him today. I'm going to give you that opportunity. I meant to ask a couple of leaders, and I, if a couple of leaders would come forward, um, so that you guys can pray with anybody that, that needs to pray. Um, sorry, I meant to kind of ask you guys before the service. Um, if you guys walk out of those doors today thinking you haven't made a choice, Satan's lying to you right now. Because whenever you walk out those doors, you will have made a choice. You're making a choice right now to either accept or reject Jesus Christ. There's no two ways around it. I implore you to accept Jesus Christ if you have not done so already. Maybe there's some, maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ before and there's things that you need to get right with Him. That's okay too. Randy and Jonathan are here. Come talk with them. I'm, I'll be up here as well. Come talk with me. Get right with God today. Don't let it go another minute. Because we're not promised a future. We're promised what we have right now. Now, the thing that we are promised, if you want to think of things in terms of the future, okay, we are eternal beings. Whether you want to think of it like that or not, we are. That's just a fact. And we're either going to live eternally or we're going to die eternally. We either be with our Creator for eternal, for eternity, or we'll be separated from our Creator for eternity. The choice is yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that you provided a substitution for our death through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Creator. And Lord, we don't deserve that. You have loved us in such a way that we can't even understand it, really. So, Lord, I ask that, uh, Lord, for those of us that are here today that have not accepted you, Lord, that you would continue to open our eyes. That we would see you. For those of us here that, that, are, that are followers, Lord, that we would become more and more like you each and every day that we would continually uh, set aside those things that, that come between you and, uh, and us. And that we would just be a shining light in such a dark, dark world. Lord, we praise you for who you are and what you have done. I ask all these things in your holy and precious name.